The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about uh, China's economic engagement in Africa, especially in the pre-COVID-19 era and in the post-COVID-19 era. And we've got two amazing scholars with us today who have written a fascinating report on that. Also, I just want to ask everybody to stay until the end of the show. We have an interview with Emmanuel Dogbevi, who is the managing editor of Ghana Business News, which is a very important news site in Ghana. Unfortunately, he had a fire that burned down his entire office, and we wanted to help him out. We're going to have an interview with him to talk about what he's doing to rebuild an independent journalism in Ghana, and also how we as a community can support this important news outlet. So I'm asking everybody to stay until the end of the show and listen to this fascinating interview with uh, Emmanuel. It's very short, but very important. Okay, let's talk about Chinese economic engagement in Africa. It's been undergoing a transformation over the past 10 years. It's not been a static relationship. Back in 2015, China-Africa trading ties really peaked at about $220 billion. And it was really at that time that we recognized that China was the dominant trading player for the African continent in a number of different countries. But since 2015, we've started to see a gradual evolution where trade has started to fall. And also investment has been mixed in some respects, in part because we've seen the rise of the Belt and Road. So in the early part of the 2000s, 2005, 2006, when the going out policy was started to be just introduced under the Hu Jintao administration, China really didn't have as many places where it could go to invest and to trade. Uh, The barriers to entry in a place like the United States, in Europe, in Japan, and even here in Southeast Asia were very, very high. Lots of regulations, cost of entry. But Africa, for the most part, was much more accessible. First of all, the United States and the Europeans had taken their eye off, so they weren't as competitive there. The regulatory barrier was quite low. And there was a market that was eager for Chinese engagement. But now what we started to see over the past 10 to 15 years, that has begun to change. And Kobus, you've talked about this a lot in previous discussions we've had on Chinese economic engagement. It's evolving away from being a purely economic relationship and increasingly to a much more diverse relationship, including politics, culture, lots of different things. And that's really going to be a challenge in some ways for African stakeholders who are not accustomed to that type of diverse challenge. Yes, um, we're seeing a bunch of changes at the same time. Um, you know, originally the the relationship was quite extractive um, and quite resource focused. Now we've seen the evolution of um, of Chinese companies that that particularly focus on African markets um, and particularly huge African consumer markets. Um, there's some also some indications of of, of man- manufacturing happening um, happening. You know, to to focus on markets in Europe. Um, but at the same time, we're also seeing the, the growth of a political relationship that might soon be outstripping the economic relationship. Well, a new analysis has just come out this month uh, looking at the economic transformation and the role of Chinese investment in Africa. It was produced by the Growth and Research Program at the Overseas Development Institute, which is a London-based think tank. Linda Calabrese and Xiaoyang Tang were the two authors of it. Uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, Tang Xiaoyang, he's an associate professor in the Department of International Relations at Tsinghua University and a deputy director at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. He's a renowned China-Africa scholar and also back on the show for the second time. Uh, Professor Tang, welcome back and a very good evening to you in Beijing. Eric, it's very nice to meet you again. Yes, it's wonderful. Last time was 2015, uh, so it's been too long. Also, Linda Calabrese is a research fellow in the International Economic Development Group at ODI and the Evidence and Policy Group. Uh, She's the China-Africa lead there as well. A very good morning to you in London. 
Thank you very much. Good morning and very happy to be here. Xiaoyang, Linda, congratulations on the paper. It's a fascinating read. It's really a comprehensive look at China's economic engagement in Africa. You do a lot of different things with the paper in terms of tackling some of the misperceptions, also addressing some of the uh, the history of it and some of the challenges related to corruption, labor and whatnot. So it covers a lot of ground. Xiaoyang, let's start with you. The paper assessed whether and how Chinese trade, investment, and finance contributed to economic transformation in Africa. Just very quickly, give us an overview of your findings so we can start our discussion with the big picture. Yeah, so in our report, uh, we find uh, the uh, effects of transformation from uh, both the micro and uh, macro uh, levels. So from the micro level, we find uh, a lot of uh, jobs uh, are created. uh, And uh, there's also some uh, uh, training, although it's mainly uh, concentrated in the low and uh, semi-skilled jobs. And uh, we also find there are company level uh, transformations, namely the Chinese, uh, they threw uh, competition with the African companies and uh, they force some unproductive uh, companies out of the market. And uh, then they uh, force uh, the uh, competitors uh, to increase uh, their technology. And there are also cases that the Chinese companies, uh, uh, they hire workers, but they actually through uh, the mobility, labor mobility, they bring some technology and skills from Chinese company to local companies. And we also see there are vertical uh, effects. So that means the Chinese companies, they have local suppliers or they hire local subcontractors. And sometimes uh, then they uh, provide also assistance and uh, training for their customers and uh, there are also joint ventures and uh, uh, co- other kind of uh, collaboration to uh, to make this kind of uh, uh, skill transfer uh, transfer happening and uh, then from the macro level we see the Chinese uh, trade and investment they significantly lowered the uh, cost of uh, machine and also capital intensive goods in Africa so that these uh, African uh, countries and also the companies they can uh, buy more uh, machines with the same man- amount of money and uh, then we also find out uh, the uh, Chinese uh, impact on Africa is uh, maybe more uh, visible than the OECD countries' investments in Africa because of the smaller tech gap. And uh, yeah, uh, there are also the, uh, the working force uh, the in Africa is uh, being built with uh, Chinese investments and also investments from other countries. Although it depends on sector and on countries' uh, uh, conditions and uh, regulations, but we see this uh, process uh, is moving on. Although it's not frictionless, they still need a lot of uh, uh, regional and uh, uh, entrepreneur enterprise level efforts together with national and global level efforts coordinated. Linda, um, let's hone in on on one of one of the the key um, findings of the report that uh, that um, Chinese companies are actually creating jobs in Africa, but it's a specific kind of job, um, and there are certain kind of complications involved with it. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the kind of impact on employment is that you found? Sure. So we reviewed a lot of reports that talk specifically about job creation and and localization of jobs specifically. So not just how many jobs are created, but also how many of these jobs actually go to African workers, to African citizens. And it seems that it's now, you know, sort of out of questions that Chinese firms do create a lot of jobs and do create a lot of jobs for African workers, not just for Chinese workers moving to Africa. However, the number of jobs that are created really depend on a number of, of on various factors. The regulations of, of, of the host country, the sector in which the firms are operating, 
um, the technical level that is required for the specific position. So we see, as Professor Tang already um, mentioned, we see that a lot of these jobs are created, especially for the low uh, and mid skill type of employees. So it's not really for uh, the top level managerial or technical positions that African workers get jobs. Um, so there's a sort of glass ceiling in that sense. But of course, this also depends on the fact that, as we mentioned, you know, Chinese investment has not been taking place in Africa for a long time. And it sort of takes quite some time to develop the sort of linkages and the sort of skills and expertise in, in the workforce in Africa as well. And just to add that this sort of glass ceiling that we see in many companies is not unique in any way to Chinese companies. It seems to be present in all other foreign companies as well that tend to employ expatriates at the top level of the top hierarchy of the company. Professor Tang, it's interesting because when I was reading the report about the labor section, I just I had this sense of like, oh, here we go again addressing labor issues. And this is something that for anybody in the China-Africa space has been an ongoing point of contention for at least 15 years, where the perception out there is that the Chinese are importing labor, even prisoners with not, whatnot, to work on African projects. It's still a widely held perception. You guys in the report try to address these misperceptions, but I'm curious as to why you think, what are the sociological reasons that you think that this perception still exists, even though there has been research done by any number of scholars from Barry Soutman in Hong Kong to uh, Carlos Oy at the University of London and so us, and now you guys, and there's a number of these that, that really disprove this. Why is it that you think that this perception is so durable about the role of Chinese labor in Africa? Now, I think the key reason for this uh, widespread uh, misperception is uh, uh, cultural uh, distance and also um, yeah, the lack of understanding of uh, China uh, in uh, Africa. And uh, uh, so people uh, just uh, see the Chinese workers, they are confined in this uh, their, uh, camp, in their like, uh, construction sides and uh, they also have a very little interaction communication with uh, uh, the local community and also the lang linguistic barriers contribute to the lack of communication so that uh, people have a lot of uh, rumors and uh, this is just uh, uh, it's uh, also then uh, kind of maybe sensitive and uh, very uh, interesting media story for the, this uh, uh, the unserious uh, uh, media and the newspapers. In fact, uh, during the research when I worked with uh, uh, Carlos Oya um, from SOAS in uh, Ethiopia, we just uh, find uh, actually out of their out of the serious uh, research report, some uh, local uh, newspapers they just uh, choose. Uh, some points and try to exaggerate and try to just uh, uh, distort the information so that it may can, can be like eye-catching. Eye uh, so I think this is the, uh, some uh, the, uh, the uh, one reason is this uh, lack of communication and uh, linguistic barriers. And uh, the other reason is uh, in uh, some uh, uh, like uh, media outside China China, then they like to have this uh, dramatic and uh, exaggerating stories, and that sells. But why do you think that Chinese stakeholders, the companies themselves, the governments, the embassy, whatever, have not done more to communicate better about this? Now, again, I'd say in the early 2000s, I would have accepted your, your, your reasoning as reasonable that the Chinese, they don't communicate well, there's a culture gap, but we're now 15 years into this relationship. And yet we haven't seen any advancement in the Chinese communication on some of these contentious issues. Why do you think that Chinese stakeholders are so reluctant to challenge some of the misperceptions with fact sheets, websites, making accessible to scholars and whatnot to kind of demystify some of these things? 
Uh, actually, I can see good result. For example, uh, your podcast is a good result, and you understand this uh, question and this uh, uh, problem already uh, much better than uh, a decade ago, right? So you also can you can access a lot of data. In fact, uh, the Chinese uh, government also has a lot of uh, data available, and uh, I even contribute to that. I also wrote. Uh, in Chinese, but I also published in English. But I think one reason is still the Chinese version may not be read so much, especially when it's from the Chinese government authority. Then uh, people tend to like uh, uh, deny it or can deny its value because the Chinese uh, uh, statistic yearbook they publish every year uh, some uh, statistic figures of uh, overseas labor in Africa and also in other countries. Although the, actually the statistics they have their like uh, strict standards, but then these are kind of of, uh, interpreted uh, as uh, uh, yeah, not as uh, too limited. So some like uh, I think uh, from uh, Howard French, he like to say, oh, it's two million, and uh, the Chinese figure is too small. But uh, it's actually about uh, just a different uh, standards and criteria of statistics. And I think it's still uh, for me then it's more about uh, the people have uh, some uh, stereotypical view on the. Chinese uh, statistic and authority, and they actually try to uh, refuse quite a lot of information provided by the Chinese statistics. Linda, um, in the report, you make you make the point that um, that Chinese um, stakeholders are frequently quite interested in African markets, but they're not particularly interested in using Africa as a, a kind of a third space for manufacturing to then export to other markets. What is behind that um, reasoning? And then also, kind of, how does that impact you know African development plans, which sometimes actually do you know kind of do model their their development plans on this kind of Chinese idea of mass low wage manufacturing at home and then and exporting out, um, out ex- externally. Right, sure. So um, first of all, um, let me say the, the, the report, of course, covers Africa as a whole, right? So we didn't hone in on any specific country. So this is sort of a general type of statement, but you see differences in countries. Um, I think this is something that's sort of quite quite important to to consider and to understand. We used to think that you know um, there's a lot of opportunities for Chinese firms who are incurring increasing costs in China to relocate to Africa, use that as a platform for production and then export. And then we saw that in reality, Chinese firms, as you mentioned, are a lot more interested in selling in 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 setting up shop in Africa to sell to the African market. Now. This is not the case everywhere. In some countries, actually, there is we see that Chinese firms um, set up shop there to export, and this is specifically in countries that have you know good market access to the US or to the uh, or to the EU in particular, um, such as Agoa, for example. Agoa countries uh, have seen a rise and increase in in, um, in exports of goods that are um, covered under Agoa. Um, but I think what's important here, you, you mentioned the impact. What's really important is to sort of take stock of this and understand and wonder whether sort of encouraging the, the production for export in this sense is a feasible strategy for African countries. And if we don't see that investors deem Africa as a useful production pr- platform in that sense, maybe then we need to adjust our expectation and think about what else can be done. Because Of course, exporting is very important, but you don't just need to export to the US or to the EU. Africa is in the process of creating a continental free trade area in which um, there will be uh, potential to to sort of to trade with all African countries, provided the infrastructure are there, provided the right regulation is there. And so you can also export within Africa. You don't just need to export to the US or to the EU and to developed markets, basically. So I think it's it's just important to sort of take stock of this and readjust expectations in terms of development plans. Linda, let me pick up on that because I live here in Vietnam, and so I have an opportunity to meet with a lot of manufacturers. And I've asked them this, this same question about why they have set up in Vietnam and not in Africa. And in fact, they are manufacturing here in Southeast Asia for export to Africa, and they will say that it's 
considerably cheaper to stay here in Vietnam because the cost of infrastructure, the roads are not there, the ports are not there, the regulatory systems there are not there. Corruption is much more endemic. Corruption's a problem here too, but nowhere near what it is in many African countries. So all of the talk of Chinese offshoring to Africa seems more aspirational And the reality is that the bulk of Chinese offshoring seems to be coming down here in Southeast Asia because the infrastructure, the culture, all the different factors are already in place. Have you seen in the course of your research any change in that dynamic to show beyond the Hua Jian Shu factory in Ethiopia that everybody points to more widespread uh, offshoring of Chinese manufacturing in Africa? There's there's a handful. So I wouldn't say it's widespread. I would say there's a handful. And I mean, a handful is very small, by the way. Yeah, I mean, and it's concentrated also, right? It's just in a few countries. So you don't see it in, in every country in Africa. Of course, it's in the ones that have sort of invested a lot more in developing manufacturing, in developing manufacturing for export, maybe sort of um, thinking a lot more strategically about special economic zones or industrial parks and these sort of things. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's really not something that's common. But this doesn't mean it cannot happen in the future, right? Because now we are at a point where producing in Africa is still expensive. Infrastructure is not um, up to the level where it should be. Uh, Labor costs remain relatively high um, in relation to productivity compared to to a lot of Asian countries. Um, It's very difficult, for example, in the garment sector for African countries to compete with Bangladesh or with Cambodia that produce at really, really competitive rates. So this just... But this doesn't mean that it will not happen. It's just if we take this snapshot now, it's still more convenient to produce in in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, Hopefully in the future, African countries will sort of focus a lot more on this and will put a lot more energy into developing an infrastructure for manufacturing that's up to the level where it should be. Professor Tang, uh, one of one of the the areas you focus on in the report is skills transfer, particularly also skills transfer between between companies. Um, and you point out that horizontal skills transfer between different companies is actually not particularly effective, but there is quite a lot of skills transfer happening vertically, meaning you know kind of up and down um, the, the, the supply chain. Um, can you unpack that a little bit? Like why why is the one so much harder um, than the other in Africa? Uh, when it comes to horizontal skill transfer, I think also uh, the one reason is, uh, for example, the demonstration effect. So especially the uh, Chinese, uh, when like uh, just uh, Linda said, if Chinese invest in this export processing sector, and it's uh, just uh, too difficult for the African local companies to follow this model because of uh, capital uh, difference and also the market knowledge about the international markets. And uh, uh, the other part of horizontal transfer is uh, the competition. For that, I think uh, it's the local companies are doing relatively better than in the uh, export uh, processing sector. So we see some of these uh, competitors, like uh, in the construction materials, the uh, African Dangote and all the uh, cement and steel makers, they sometimes can even uh, yeah, uh, surpass the Chinese in terms of uh, technology. But uh, the reason for like uh, uh, yeah, so for the limitation is uh, the African market is uh, rather yeah fragmented and uh, uh, it's not big enough so that it uh, uh, doesn't uh, g- uh, yeah have uh, much more potential for further technology skill uh, improvement. While the um, for the vertical ones, I think. Uh, uh, that's also mainly in this uh, domestic market oriented uh, business. So we see the uh, local, because it works with the local uh, raw material suppliers, with the local clients. So the Chinese investors, they have more interaction with the uh, local uh, companies. So I think the uh, more interaction in this uh, uh, vertical uh, manner, it, it, uh, that's the reason. So you need to work uh, with uh, more local partners. So then it will naturally spill over. 
Can you just explain to us, for those who are not familiar, and I don't really understand the difference between, you're talking about vertical skills transfer and horizontal skills transfer. Just for those of us who don't understand the difference, can you explain that? Horizontal one means uh, these companies, uh, they are in the same sector, so, like uh, the shoemakers versus shoe, shoemakers. And uh, uh, typically, there are uh, demonstration effect and also uh, competition effect, as well as uh, labor mobility between this, uh, the same, uh, com- same type of companies. While the vertical transfer, that's between companies which are not in the same sector, like the... Uh, uh, shoemakers uh, with the leather provider or with uh, the uh, shoe material uh, producers. So they uh, actually form this uh, upstream and uh, downstream relationship. So Linda, you um, another another um, brief explainer. You you mentioned that there's been instances where Chinese trade, particularly in West Africa, has caused um, Dutch disease, so-called Dutch disease. I wonder if you could tell us um, what Dutch disease is, and then you know kind of how that actually happened in 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 West Africa. So Dutch disease is when you get a huge inflow of foreign currency. And that appreciates your currency and then therefore the the economy sort of loses competitiveness in a way. So because you get so much money that you are sort of less incentivized to produce productively and then to export as well, right? You become so rich that you can just import from outside. That's sort of like the... The, the, the simple explanation. Of course, West Africa is, is a region that's quite rich in, um, in natural resources as well. So one of the ways in which you get a lot of foreign currency if, is if you start selling you know, oil or gas or whatever other natural resource. Um, and I think, yeah, in the report, we sort of identified that there's some studies that have covered this, particularly in relation to Chinese investment. And there seems to be some evidence of this, but it's really not that strong. So it doesn't seem like overall this has been a huge problem related to Chinese investment in extractives in Africa. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. I'd like to get both of your take on a, some, an interesting phenomena that seems to be happening with regards to COVID-19. Now, your paper was written prior to COVID-19. The research was done. So you don't factor in all of the changes that we've seen in Chinese economic engagement over the past, say, eight to nine months. So with that out there, uh, you know, fully understand if if you're not prepared to speak about this. But there was a, a fascinating report that came out this month by Allianz Research, the research arm of the German Financial Services Group, that called and predicted for a China-less recovery And the report was basically warning uh, African and Latin American countries that they can no longer depend on China in the way that they have during the time of what you've talked about in your report. Let me read a couple quotes for you. They say that China is likely to gradually disengage from the debt financing of low and middle income countries amid an ongoing repayment challenge. And this also comes amid the, the, the 14th five-year plan that was just announced and unveiled by the Communist Party, where the focus of the five-year plan is much more on domestic consumption. It's also focused much more on self-reliance. And these are trends that really kind of take the going out from the mid-2000s, the early mid-2000s, and then basically turn it on its head to looking inwards. Also, they say these countries would have to secure funding from somewhere else that is, official lenders or financial markets to refinance the large amounts of euro bonds maturing in 2022 and 2023. So, Professor Tong, I'd like to start with you, and Linda, then I'd like to get your take on this, about a China-less recovery. That is, the future post-COVID-19 may not have the same China engagement that we have seen pre-COVID-19. Again, trends that are long underway, but COVID just expedited them. Tell us what you think of that theory. Uh, I think that a report, uh, in fact, uh, really um, interpre- misinterprets uh, the 14, uh, 15, uh, five year plan in a wrong direction. 
because this uh, like the circ uh, what called the cycle internal cycle that's uh, actually not china initiated but that's the result of this uh, sino us trade war which was uh, initiated by donald trump during the last four years so that china said now we need to uh, we have to focus more on the like self sufficiency and but but that's uh, actually rather address uh, the technological uh, struggle with the U.S. and this uh, potential sanctions from the advanced uh, economies. So in that uh, context, in fact, China would uh, rather put more emphasis <laughs> on developing links uh, with uh, the uh, developing countries. That's my feeling. And that also China, why it uh, uh, emphasizes the internal cycle it also said the internal and the international cycle should be uh, uh, yeah, improved at the same time. And, uh, but uh, of course, the COVID-19, it changed the global economy. So China wouldn't uh, uh, give the uh, lending just as uh, before, because uh, all the companies, they face uh, the fiscal and the debt stress. And I think uh, in this year, we can already see China is slowing down uh, the lending and also then tries to uh, renegotiate and restructure the debts with some uh, countries so we who which face uh, the larger burden of repayment but i don't see any in any place that china is going to stop that in fact china uh, would put will put a lot of uh, emphasis in the coming years on gradually recovery and uh, they know these countries still need uh, uh, infrastructure and also need the uh, 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 fundings for uh, economic recovery. Linda, what's your take on uh, China in the post-COVID era in terms of the recovery and whether or not it will be engaged in the same way as it has, say, in the previous 10 years? So there's two main points here that that I consider. The first one is I agree with Professor Tang that it seems like the the discussions around sort of a more inward look or, or dual circulation is really skewed towards the the it seems to be really skewed on the on the internal side of, of dual circulation on the domestic side. But the reality is we don't know yet how that will look like. And it's true that this has been sort of a lot more in response to to the to the external circumstances related to it, to the United States to the trade war to the you know technology and so on and so forth rather than what happens in Africa and, and in Asia as well so really i don't think we can yet say that this definitely means a more inward look for china um so that's on the sort of policy side on the economic side specifically we at odi have been tracking data for of china's economic response to COVID, in particular in terms of trends in investment, trends in trade, and so on and so forth. We hope to publish this, this data soon, but we've been using publicly available um, Chinese um, data for that. And we are seeing that actually what happens is that investments are sort of at similar level as foreign investment, Chinese foreign investments, are at similar level as last year in general, but they're actually growing in Belt and Road countries compared to the same time last year. Dispatch foreign labor, which is the overseas labor, is still slow, it's still like less than last year, basically, but it's recovering. But then production of iron, steel, and so on, the, the sort of the production, the overproduction that's one of the drivers of infrastructure construction, that's actually still uh, still positive. So in that sense, we actually expect that this investment is going to continue. We have also seen that Chinese overseas economic activities in terms of investment contracts and so on has actually shifted away from Europe and moved more towards Asian and African countries. I mean, one thing that we need to remember is that for this year, the IMF forecasts negative uh, growth for most countries, but there's a handful that's going to have a positive growth, and one of these is China. So actually, China could be a driving force for recovery 
rather than um, rather than us expecting a Chinaless future. You, you recently wrote a comment for ODI uh, about the Zambia crisis, um, and there you you called for um, you, you know for African governments to be a lot more um, hard nosed and a lot more careful in terms of the lending that they take on um, or the, the borrowing that they take on, and then um, specifically also to to really make sure that the that the infrastructure they they're taking loans for will actually spur development. So I was wondering, you know, kind of what your impressions are of, of how effective that decision making has, has been over the last while. Um, you know, kind of, uh, do, do you see cases of African governments where, where this kind of decision making has really evolved? Um, and and also particularly where, they, where they're also focusing on, on their neighborhood and, you know, with including neighboring countries in, in development plans, rather than just a national plan? I can't really point to a very positive example, one country that I'm going to tell you, oh, this country is doing very well. I focus specifically on on East Africa in my research, um, Uganda, Rwanda in particular. So I can't really say that I've seen a lot of, you know, sort of these thoughtful decisions being taken at the moment, especially with countries and also be involved in electoral politics and so on and so forth. I think we see very interesting examples from Asia. Um, if that's useful in a way. Myanmar in particular has sort of put in a very sort of uh, strict system for screening all sorts of investment, not only Chinese investment, not only Belt and Road infrastructure construction, but all sorts of foreign sort of infrastructure projects. And therefore, they have been applying this uh, method a bit more consistently and systematically. So I think we see interesting examples out there. I can't point to any from Africa at the moment, but I don't know the entirety of the African context. Professor Tang, let's wrap up our discussion following up on Kobus's question about the debt issue in Zambia. Uh, people are very confused about what China's motivations, ambitions, and what their policies are regarding debt, because we just don't see a lot of communication coming out of the Chinese side. You're somebody who does interact with senior level policymakers and stakeholders in China. Can you give us a little bit of insight into how the Chinese government and policymakers and people like Wu Peng in the foreign ministry regard the debt situation in Africa, particularly in countries like Kenya, Zambia, Angola, and Ethiopia that are highly exposed to Chinese debt? I think uh, actually for me, the Chinese uh, government's uh, policy direction is quite clear. And uh, they often uh, give uh, statements regarding the debt issues. I think the problem is uh, rather these uh, views are different from uh, those of the Western lenders. And uh, then uh, there are uh, uh, different opinions. And uh, for me, the Chinese uh, government is uh, always clear that uh, uh, China are very cautious uh, in uh, giving out uh, debts. Uh, but uh, uh, China, meanwhile, opposes conditionality. So there, therefore, you see the uh, Chinese uh, loans are not, uh, often they do not count uh, the majority of this uh, debt stress, but it's uh, rather this uh, market-based uh, euro bonds, they actually accumulate to this uh, dangerous level. And also the another way is uh, the Chinese uh, loans, uh, they uh, are often linked with the projects. So that, that's a practice has a, which are in place already for decades long. So the Chinese uh, rather look at the feasibility of the projects and especially those infrastructure and also some investments which may contribute to the economic transformation of that country. And, uh, but of course, uh, there are also some lessons. Uh, for example, uh, whether these uh, projects, uh, are they productive enough? Can, uh, do they really meet the uh, expectations? These uh, Chinese lenders are also learning. And uh, also in this year, then this uh, unexpected uh, uh, global uh, change, they also uh, raise new challenges for Chinese 
lending practice. And I think the Chinese uh, uh, government already in the uh, right, I think in March and in April already uh, make it very clear that China is willing to uh, renegotiate uh, with these countries uh, uh, which have uh, debt stress and uh, China uh, understands uh, their difficulty and uh, uh, will give uh, flexibility. The report is Africa's Economic Transformation, the Role of Chinese Investment. Uh, this is going to go on the kind of top 10 kind of reading list. If you want a baseline benchmark type of, of, of report that gives you background and insight, this is going to be one of them. It was written by Linda Calabrese, who is a research fellow in the International Economic Development Group at ODI. And the Overseas Development Institute, incidentally, also published the report. Also, Professor Tang Xiaoyang, uh, who's in the Department of International Relations at Tsinghua University and Deputy Director at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Uh, thank you both for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it, and we're so grateful for your insights on this important issue at this really critical time in China-Africa relations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gobas, I have to tell you that I'm a little bit confused after our discussion with Linda and Professor Tang because I'm seeing all these contradictory arguments that are coming forward, and both sides are compelling. And to be fair, this is the China-Africa relationship as it's always been, where the good and the bad... The easy and the complex always sit side by side. But hear me out here. So in today's newsletter, we talked a lot about this Allianz report on the China-less recovery. And there is a lot of evidence to support that China is turning, maybe not inwards, but it's becoming more risk averse. So to Professor Tang's point, the five-year plan was definitely geared towards the United States. But in some ways, I think that reflects the priorities of the Chinese, that they are hardening up their, their economy to do battle with the United States if they have to going forward in the Biden administration. But it means in some ways that they're not as focused on other parts of the world as, say, Latin America or Africa. Again, uh, I think scholars who know a lot more than me about this will, will argue it. And the five-year plans are so detailed that you can pick points out and say, well, no, it's this or it's that. So they're, they're difficult documents to, to, to discuss. That being said, to hear that there's more investment, the trade is holding up, it's, it's hard because they're right. But on the other hand, you see this very compelling argument that says they're tired of getting burned by bad loans. We've heard we've talked to a lot of people on the show that say, you know what, we're going to they're going to start pulling back, expect money to go elsewhere on the Belt and Road. Africa is not producing the dividends. I remember a conversation we had with Chung Chung, who was the chief economist of the Made in Africa initiative. And he was talking about how manufacturing isn't going to come to Africa because of automation and the fourth industrial revolution in China. Also, because of the cost of manufacturing elsewhere around the world, namely in Southeast Asia, is way cheaper and the demand for raw materials is going to go down in the future because China is trying to evolve its way away from being a manufacturing economy and more towards a service economy, much like the United States and Europe. So you see all of these contradictory messages and indicators that really leave, well, it leaves me very confused. And to be honest with you, I don't know what to think about it right now. Yeah, it's very complicated. I mean, I, I assume that some of these comp contradictions are also because also due to scale. Um, you know, that, that a lot of these dynamics are happening at different levels at once. Um, so it depends a little bit on, you know, kind of on, on the, the, you know, the, the height of one's, of one's view. Um, but, you know, it, you know, in, in, in terms of, in terms of the African relationship, um, it seems that China has put so much work into building stable platforms to support that relationship. You know, FOCAC itself is, is, is such a kind of a, a, a big superstructure of its own that clearly there's been a lot of investment in keeping the relationship going. Um, you know, the, I 100% expect the relationship to shift and change, um, not, not only due to Chinese preoccupations, but also due to African ones. Um, but it'll be interesting to see, um, for example, you know, kind of how the, the the, the example of, of a company like Transian, you know, kind of which is so built on African consumption, so not particularly kind of prominent within China, so completely a, a creature of China, Chinese outward expansion. You know, like even even if the five year plan kind of focuses on on if you know on, on a China that turns inwards, Chinese certain Chinese actors are going to keep you know kind of reaching outwards. 
So, you know, I guess it then becomes this kind of interesting issue of like breaking down the different kinds of Chinese actors and looking at the interactions between them. Yeah, that's very interesting. And also we may see more technology going outwards, which might explain, in fact, why they don't need as much labor because the digital Silk Road may actually become more prominent. Again, these are all just theories. It's so much is in motion right now. Interesting, though, one observation that I have just from looking at all of the latest debt news coming out of Africa is that countries are turning to the Eurobond markets and the IMF and the World Bank for more financing. So Kenya is is out to raise, I think, $3.4, $3.5 billion from the IMF. Ivory Coast just put forward its first kind of what they're calling the pandemic bond, which is the first euro bond in during the pandemic. And it's interesting that we're not hearing any African country right now knocking on China's door. We've not heard any big deal announced about Chinese financing, Chinese loans. They've been very, very quiet on that. And I wonder, again, I don't know, I'm just speculating here. I'm wondering if there's a do not disturb sign on the China Exim Bank kind of office in in, in African capitals. Like, we're just going to hold and wait and see how all this debt restructuring goes before we throw more cash. That being said, there are some legacy deals that are still being negotiated out, such as the Senghua uh, coal power plant in Zimbabwe we've talked about, also funding of uh, Uganda's uh, standard gauge railway. These are deals that started pre-COVID, which are still working their way through. But anything post-COVID, we haven't really seen too much. And I'm just wondering if maybe that might be an indication that the China less recovery argument may have some weight. That being said, my last point on this, both may be true at the same time. And this is, again, another part of the China-Africa dynamic that is often overlooked, that it can be both and rather than either or. So on the one hand, you may see a pullback of some of the state-to-state financing. And then as Professor Tang talked about, there's going to be an engagement on the corporate, the private sector side, even some of the SOEs who behave in many ways like commercial actors. So we might see the contradictory trends play out at the same time. Final thoughts on this before we get to our interview on uh, independent media. Yeah, I agree with you that it's it's a very difficult situation to read at the moment. Like, you, you know, kind of what, what I would love, and, and I think we should, you know, maybe hopefully we'll be able to get to get a person like this as a future guest, is for someone to put the, Af- the Africa-China debt situation into the context of the entire China debt situation. You know, because we've seen indications that, that domestic debt is a big issue in China, that um, particularly for state on enterprises, you know, kind of company-related debt or for, for SOEs is a massive problem. Um, and even defaults on debt, you know, kind of within within Chinese SOEs is, is becoming an, an increasing problem. So I, I was wondering, like, how the China-Africa debt situation looks like from within the China, the larger China debt problem. Um, you know, and, and there I, I don't have any particular insights, I just, but I think it, it, it seems to me that, that that's something to consider. That would be interesting. I, too, don't have any insights on Chinese domestic debt, but there are a lot of great people out there who do. So we'll put that down on the guest list. Uh, Let's just change gears here a little bit. And we're going to do something out of the ordinary. But it was a story that I wanted to bring uh, to you about a tragedy that happened in Ghana. And it was the offices of GhanaBusinessNews.com, which is one of the few independent news sites in West Africa and in Ghana, and it burned down. And it really struck me because in many ways, the creator, the founder, the managing editor, uh, Emmanuel Dogbevi, is in some ways just like you and I, Kobus, where it's a passion project and he wanted to bring business news and he felt that independent journalism was needed in that part of the world. And so a GoFundMe page was created for him. I donated $100 and I'm asking that our community also consider, I know these are difficult times for a lot of people, but donating to his uh, GoFundMe page to help him rebuild. And I had the chance to speak with him uh, yesterday just to find out more about what happened and for him to introduce a little bit about what Ghana Business News is and why it's so important. Emmanuel Dobevi, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We, I wish it was under better circumstances. Before we get into what happened, could you briefly introduce everyone to Ghana Business News and the work that you do there? Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for having me. Um, I started Ghana Business News 12 years ago when I realized that business journalism in Ghana wasn't up to scratch. Uh, largely, if you Google about companies that operate in Ghana, you will find a lot of stories generated about these companies that were 
largely uh, stories from news releases, press releases, seminars, conferences, statements, and you don't find really critical articles and stories that look into say uh, their conduct, are they ethical, what, what is their tax you know, standard standing and so on and so forth. And you don't find a lot of stories looking at, say, the financial statement of a company. You will read news about how much a company has made profit in a year and how much taxes they have paid. But you don't find stories on tax avoidance and so on and so forth. So I decided that it was time for uh, a journalist indeed to do something uh, that looks into critical reporting of businesses, financial news, and so on and so forth. And that was the motivation that led me to start Ghana Business News. And how does it support itself? Does it only through advertising? Do you get corporate money? What's the, uh, the business plan? Well, the business plan originally was to be able to generate revenue from advertising. But as it turned out, the advertising uh, sector industry in Ghana is it's a deep water uh, you need to to learn to swim deep to be able to be to to get advertising. Uh, I did everything I could uh, that I know uh, best in in terms of trying to attract advertising, and it never worked. So we don't get advertising at all, and therefore I am compelled to use my uh, what I call my lunch money. I literally fund the website from. Uh, half of what I need to use for lunch uh, every day. I started with my savings, uh, ran it for like two, three years, and then I ran out of my savings. So I literally depend on if, say, I get a consultancy occasionally, which I do, like, say, uh, do some communication strategy for someone. Uh, I also do training of journalists and communication experts and so on and so forth. I do also training for politicians and executives of companies once in a while. And I make a little money and then I apply it back into, into the website. So that's how I keep the website going. Uh, there are times I, I'm completely out of cash. I borrow from friends. There are friends who believe in what I do. They trust in what I do. So when I fall on them, say, can I get a loan to pay for rent, to pay for internet, to pay for hosting, to pay for a trip to do a story, they, they, they are kind enough to loan me that money. And then when I'm able to make money from what I call handy work, uh, like I, I operate like a handyman, I'm able to pay back. And then occasionally I do get funding from rep for reporting grants, uh, like say Senozo, uh, the Journalism Fund in Europe, or say the ICIR in Nigeria. But I've never been able to, to get funding from uh, organizations in Ghana to do any investigation or any story. I remember uh, way back about four, three, four years ago that I was able to get some reporting grant from one organization in Ghana and that is it. So in the 12 years that I have operated, I haven't been able to get uh, funding from any Ghanaian organization to do any investigation. So it's really what we call a bootstrap and a passion project for you where you're just making, you're just kind of stringing this together in any way you can. So it makes it even more painful to hear about what happened with this fire. Tell us what happened and how much did you lose? Well, I, I was home that day because of the pandemic. I don't go often to the office. Uh, and that week, I think I've been to the office only twice. And largely because, again, I also operate alone. Uh, until recently when I got an intern, so I, I was compelled to spend some time with him in the office. We're just getting settled down uh, to start working together. And that Thursday, uh, it happened. I didn't go to the office. I was home having dinner when I got a phone call that there was a fire in the building housing our office. Uh, and I was told that, well, the fire service was around, so I was kind of assured, so I relaxed. Five minutes after I got another call that the fire has reached uh, the side of the building where my office was. So I had to stop dinner, jump into my car, rush to the place, only to see the entire building raised down by fire. And did you lose everything in the office? There was nothing left? I lost, I lost everything in the office. Uh, there were three laptops, two printers, a scanner, uh, my furnishing, uh, furniture, um, books, a lot of books that I have kept over the years, books I have brought 
from school, from graduate school, books I have bought in my travels, books I use for training, uh, lots of uh, material that will serve as background to stories, more or less like an archive. Uh, I lost my camera accessories, tripods, two audio recorders, one brand new upgraded version of Zoom recorder, uh, HN5. Um, fortunately, my cameras were, I have two cameras, they were at home at the time, so that's how come the cameras were saved. But my rigs for my cameras and other accessories were all bent in the fire. I couldn't salvage anything. So you have a lot of kind people and friends in Accra, in Ghana, and around the world who believe in what you do, and they set up a GoFundMe page. My understanding is that you're far too humble and modest to do this on your own, so people did it for you, and you've started to raise close to 2,000 euros. Uh, if people donate to that page, which I have myself, and I'm hoping that anybody listening to this podcast will do so as well, where will the money go? What will it be used for? Like you said, I'm lucky to have good friends who believe in what I do. And I think that as a journalist, if you are transparent and honest and sincere with the way you do your work, uh, people don't even need to see you. They just read your works and they can tell you are an open-minded and honest person. So my good friend, uh, the Dutch journalist Olivier, spoke to my friend Will at the ICIJ and they thought that, look, we need to help Emmanuel get back on his feet. And they thought, well, we can raise at least 2,500 euro, which will be enough to at least cover uh, some of the equipment for Emmanuel to get back on his feet. I think th that's, that's really kind of them and kind of everybody else who is uh, making a donation to raise this amount to support what I do. So basically this amount will go into uh, getting some new equipment like laptops, uh, getting accessories for my cameras because in about two, three weeks there will be elections in Ghana and we will need to cover the elections. So this donation will go into getting us at least basically to be able to run around and do the work we do. As I speak to you now, I wanted to meet with my volunteers, but we have nowhere to meet. There's no place to go and meet and plan and discuss uh, the, the, how we're going to cover the, the elections. Uh, so that itself is it's, it's, uh, a big challenge which we hope to be able to overcome. So basically, the money will go into buying basic equipment that we need to do our work. Uh, as we think of how to find a place to settle and run an office. Emmanuel Dogbevi is the managing editor, founder, creator, and the passion behind the GhanaBusinessNews.com website. It did burn to the ground. He is still keeping it up, uh, but your donations will help to support the independent journalism voices that are so needed right now, especially in Ghana, before the elections, but all around the world. And we need to support journalists like this if it matters to us. And as one independent journalist to another, um, I'm just, again, my heart goes out to you and what you're doing, but I'm so impressed with how you are rebuilding. If you want to get in touch with Emmanuel, you can find him on Twitter at Emmanuel Dogbevi. I'll go ahead and put a Twitter link in the show notes as well as a link to the GoFundMe page. Emmanuel, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and to tell us about what happened at Ghana Business News. We're looking forward to reading your continued coverage and uh, wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much, Eric, for having me. I'm so grateful. And thanks for the donation. Kobus, so Emmanuel doesn't do things directly connected to China, Africa. But again, independent journalism is something that you and I are both very passionate about. And it's so important today, especially as he mentioned that supporting a business like this is incredibly difficult. You and I we struggle to put what we do uh, you know, out there for everybody. And so we are grateful that we have subscribers to our newsletter and, and whatnot. But for him, where he's depending on donations and he's depending on his own money, it's, uh, it's really tragic to see what happened when, when fire kind of takes apart that dream. Yeah, it's so tragic. And at the same time, one, one can't you know, say enough how important this journalism is in, in the African scene, particularly business journalism. It's, it's, it's hard to do. It's, it's, a, it's a specialized form of journalism. And it's incredibly important because, because a lot of really big deals in Africa frequently go uncovered because there's a lack of, of, of this kind of specialized journalism. So it's a really a crucial service, not only to, to Ghana, but to the entire continent and the rest of the world. So again, this happened 
happened less than a month before presidential elections in Ghana, where his coverage is absolutely vital. So if you would consider making a small donation to the GoFundMe page, I've put it in the show notes uh, for you to do it. He's an, a, a really just a fantastic journalist, well-regarded, internationally respected around the world. So your, your money is going to go to good use. Um, and I just, again, just Really excited that we had the chance to introduce you to Emmanuel. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. If you want to support what we are doing, we would be so grateful for that. And that would be through a subscription to the China Africa Project daily email newsletter. Copes and I spend, uh, you know, a lot of time every week. I put it together about 12 hours a day to go through all of the day's news about China, Africa, kind of bring out the analysis, bring out the research, things like what Allianz did and their report on the Chinaless recovery, also breaking down uh, research from people like Professor Tang and Linda Calabresi. So that's very easy for you to kind of every day just get a rundown of here's what people are saying. These are the discussions. If you'd like to sign up, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. We'll give you two weeks for free just to try it out. You can cancel at any time. It's only $15 a month for for professionals and $7 a month for students and teachers. So we would love for you to be part of our growing reader community. So that'll do it. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another show. For Kobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Orlander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>